Hi everyone. Wow, I've got so many new subscribers. I'm really appreciative. It's fantastic. Um, it's fantastic to see that people are finding value from my meandering, jabbering on about <clears throat> about trumpet stuff. Okay, so today's um, topic is going to be that of why I the day's topic is going to be about lip intrusion into the cup of your mouthpiece. This mouthpiece here is an old TCERC, one of the first ones that I was having made. Sold about 50 of those, and I was really pleased with how that was going. Um, it's kind of a business that got shut down by Brexit, but anyway. Um, what does lip intrusion mean? Now, this isn't something that I want to claim has an awful lot to do with, um, let's say, your approach to playing. Um, it absolutely does have everything to do with your approach to playing. But I've been misinterpreted in the past by by uh, people who've who've uh, who've mistakenly thought that what I was saying was that if you study the Maggio method, that means you're going to be having lots of lip intrusion because you are puckering the lips. That's not what this is. That's not what this means at all. Um, what else does it not mean? Well, it doesn't mean that because you have a big face that you're gonna have lots of lip intrusion. It doesn't mean that because you have a small face that you won't have lots of lip intrusion. These are all the sorts of misconceptions that people have. And um, I just, I suppose it's really important for me to say from the off that I've taught people the TCE um, for a long time. And I've taught people with big lips. I've taught people with small lips. I think I pretty much come into that small lip category when it comes to it, when I form my chops before playing there's not a lot of uh, what for me is the pink part of my lips, the red part of the lips. Um, there's not a lot of that showing. What, you, what people who have watched me play for a period of time will tell you is that I uh, am the sort of person for whom it appears that my bottom lip is tucked in under the top lip. I always try to avoid those sorts of conversations because it's not an ideal that I promote. What I tend to say to people is that if you were to ask me whether I roll my lips in as I ascend in pinch, the answer is probably yes. However, my tongue and my bottom lip are in constant contact and hopefully my tongue and my top lip are in pretty much constant contact as well. And the result of that is that even if my lips were to roll in, effectively what they're actually doing is gripping the tongue or they are pushing against the tongue. They're controlling this aperture that exists between the, the top of the tongue and the cutting edge of the top teeth and or the inside of the top lip. So it's not this roll in, roll out action that you may have um, read about in the Balanced Embouchure book or um, a, you know, sort of understood from Roy Stevens. Um, I think that that's actually very frequently misinterpreted, to be honest, but that's a whole other topic. I've said in other videos that one day I'll give you my Roy Stevens rant, but um, not today. Um, so, so this is a thing. What does it mean? Well, as with everything that I talk about on this YouTube channel, I can only draw upon my own experience. I can draw upon books that I've read, websites I've read, conversations I've had, uh, YouTube videos that I've watched, etc., etc. But in terms of what I can tell you about what ideas have led me to the place I am now, where I'm playing the trumpet in a significantly different way from how I was when I left music college 15 years ago. 18 years ago. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> no. Um, in 2005. Um, 
I, I'm playing in a significantly different way from how I was then. And all I can do is is tell you what ideas led to me to where I am and reflect on, you know, how positive they are. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Now, I think that over, over a long period of time, because I have read a lot of books and because I've spent a lot of hours talking with other um, aspiring trumpet players who have achieved a lot, and um, yeah, and just you know, trying to get a bigger picture of the whole Jerome Callet approach, and obviously getting the majority of my physical one-on-one -on -one advice from Bob Civiletti, whose approach is slightly different from from um, from what many people think Jerry's ideas are and or were. Um, you know, that puts me in a position where I look back and I start to wonder where I got these ideas from. Like, who who was it that actually told me X, Y, and Z? Who is it that actually told me this exercise is really good for that? And this, this in many ways, goes... Um, it's something that I've explained in previous videos where I've said that, you know, you're not going to get Jerome's distilled pedagogy in a vial from me. What you're going to get is um, my experience based upon the knowledge that I have gained as a direct result of pursuing his techniques. Um, and what you will get when you decide to study the TCE won't be the same as me. It will be the same thing. It will be you developing your ideas based upon your experience and based upon what works for you at the time. I think that something that's really important is to keep rereading the materials, keep rewatching the videos. Honestly, even after a decade, every time I watch that super, that Mastering Super Chops DVD, I notice something that I've never noticed before. It's really quite remarkable. Um, that's not to say that it's a fantastic work of art or that um, that any of the ideas that are on it are communicated in a way that most people could understand. But what it is, is it's a resource that will apply to you in different ways at, at different times as a result of you walking this path. And it is invaluable for that reason. In the same way that that old 1987 Super Chops VHS is invaluable. Um, though I, under the impression that there isn't a way currently for anybody to view that online. When Cupress bought the rights to some of Jerome Callet's uh, written materials, I had a verbal agreement or at least what I interpreted as a verbal agreement with this guy, uh, his first name's Tim, um, who runs Q-Press or owns Q-Press or something. I had an uh, agreement with him that I would take the Super Chomps VHS off of uh, public availability on YouTube. Um, and there was still a link to it so that you could watch it through my website but that website doesn't exist anymore so um yeah i'll have to have a think about this i don't want to break that agreement but at the same time you know the material on that video puts super chops into context in a way that reading the book alone does not okay so the piece of information that I am alluding to um, is that basically I can't think of the, the correct terminology, like the exact words that were said to me, but basically um, I was given the impression by one source or another of Jerome Callet's pedagogy that um, the reason that I was not capable of playing on a shallow trumpet mouthpiece um, was because I used too much air when I played the trumpet and in doing so I would blow the lips into the cup 
what happens then is that the lips touch the bottom of the cup and they stop vibrating. So what we're basically saying here is that overblowing is the reason that you can't use a shallow mouthpiece. Um, now, if I solved that problem just by choosing to use less air, then maybe I'm some kind of genius. <laughs> but I think there's more to it than that. Um, the instructions that came with the Master Super Chops DVD that at the time were basically all I had access to um, and the Trumpet Herald Forum, for better or worse. Um, they described the tongue being in a position somewhat like this. Open the jaw, place the tip of the tongue behind the bottom teeth and then curl the tongue forward in a wedge so that it acts like a spring holding the teeth apart. Then you can close the mouth around the tongue and the act of gripping the tongue with the lips is what is going to help you to control your pitch. Um, and it talks about how basically all of that comes from the bottom lip gripping the tongue because it then it pushes against the tongue which spreads and fills the space and all the stuff we've previously said. Now, that idea combined with the idea that using too much air will cause you to uh, recede the tongue because you'll do it naturally trying to get the air through. Um, those ideas combined is probably what resulted in me being able to suddenly, and I mean pretty much spontaneously, be able to play on a whole range of different trumpet equipment. And I think that this is the thing that fundamentally when people come to mouthpieces that they think they can't play because they've got certain lip shape or something. I, I, I often very quickly sort of dismiss what they're saying by saying, look, your lips move. Your lips move in and out. They move side to side. You can open the jaw, you can close the jaw, you can put the tongue for all this stuff is, is universal. This is where I've gotten myself in trouble on Facebook by saying things like, your face is more similar to mine than it is different. And people think that I'm trolling, but I'm not. What I'm saying to you is that if someone wants you to, let's say, create a flat surface, you can do it. You can do it by looking at pictures and copying them or copying what I'm doing in this, in this video. You know, roll your lips in, roll the lips out. You can all do it. You can, I wouldn't go so far as to say that we've all got the same range of motion in the jaw. And in fact, I taught someone for a number of years who had done themselves harm in the past because a teacher told them they needed to push their jaw forward when they play the trumpet. Um, my experience is that by practicing einsets and ansets and double pedal tone exercises, my teeth now align better than they used to because over time I have, I have learned to gently stretch all of this stuff into positions that it didn't habitually move into in the past. But really this is, you know, this is one of the things where we're talking about defining embouchure. Um, or just, no, what I mean is defining embouchure change. What is embouchure change? Well, it is going to be choosing to do something differently from what you've been doing in the past. And hopefully you're not just making it up because <laughs> I know a lot of people no, what I've, I've known a bunch of people who've thought that the definition of embouchure change is to move the position of the, of the mouthpiece on the lips. And I would argue with those people that by your definition of embouchure change, every time you buy a bigger or smaller mouthpiece, you're learning a new embouchure. And that's not, that's not how it works. But I've showed people in the past that I pretty much have an anchor point on my bottom lip here where I place the mouthpiece at every time. And so that means that if I play on something small, especially something incredibly small, like um, I've, got a box of, I've got a box of mouthpieces. If I play on something like Bob Civiletti's TCE3, which is like a 0.585 uh, inches internal diameter, or indeed here is a Superchops 1SS, which is the same. 
then because of my anchor point being on the bottom lip, the amount of top lip that, that gets into the cup is less with a smaller mouthpiece. But if I was to take something larger, this box does not contain big mouthpieces because it's my Jerome Callet mouthpieces box. <laughs> um, uh, if I was to take something larger, like a Bach 1C, then that anchor point on my bottom lip stays the same, but the rest of the mouthpiece occupies more top lip. And so it looks like I've moved the position of the mouthpiece, though I actually haven't. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the position of the mouthpiece does, does not define the embouchure. If you're thinking in Reinhardt terms, whether you're an upstream or a downstream player, whether you're thinking about uh, the direction of your pivot, as he would define it, then, yeah, these things can very muchly, uh, very muchly, they can very much be decided by the placement of the mouthpiece on the lips. But it's not the same thing as, um, yeah, just generally going, okay, oh, I've decided to move things by an immeasurably small amount, and now I have a new embouchure. No, you don't have a new embouchure. You only have a new embouchure if you're actually changing something about your approach to playing. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. I've got to. I've got to get off this horse. Um, so, uh, lip intrusion. What is lip intrusion? Well, it's it's how much lip you habitually put into a mouthpiece. Now, the reason that I've that I'm mentioning this is because um, I've had I've just had a bunch of conversations with people about it recently, and I think it's quite important. So, all of the um, TCE stuff aside, I've mentioned how Jerry taught me one way or another that using too much air causes the lips to collapse into the cup. And when they do, they touch the cup, they stop vibrating, blah, blah, blah. I've used that information in the past to make a graphic um, that I called the cycle of pressure. Which is which sort of defined by the idea that you can enter this cycle at any point, but if you start overblowing, your lip will collapse, and then you'll use mouthpiece pressure to push it back to where it should be, um, and that means that it then doesn't vibrate properly, and so you blow harder, and the whole cycle continues. And you know, for many people, and I'd include myself in this at one point. That's just how they play the trumpet. <laughs> and, you know, it will work fine for you up until a certain point in life. But eventually, um, you'll just get old and tired and you'll want to... Um, it'll be too late. <laughs> no, it won't. You can always learn TCE any point. Um, but it'll be much harder to take on board when you've got 40 years of experience playing the incorrect way. So, so this is the thing. Some people may actually tell you when you play that you should try and fill the space in the mouthpiece. Maybe they don't. I think that maybe the reason that it is significant, and this is for most people, it is significant because if you're putting your chops into the cup, you are making it effectively smaller. Now, I stand next to a, to a guy in a big band who plays on a Shilke 14A4A, and if you look into his mouthpiece, you can see tarnish marks. That's quite common. Well, the tarnishing is the oxidation of the silver plate. Um, and it really only happens in the place where water and air are constantly hitting the mouth, the, the, the silver plate on the mouthpiece. Now, this, um, this oxidation or this tarnishing happens only in the smallest, low, lowest, say, third of the mouthpiece. And all of the rest of the mouthpiece is shiny. And what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that his lips protrude into the mouthpiece so much that the effective size of the mouthpiece is absolutely tiny. And that's how come he can play the lead trumpet part so well um, on a mouthpiece that I would actually consider to be pretty big. I know that compared to some, 
you know, more orchestral equipment than 14A, 4A might be considered small. But I've always thought that that mouthpiece was intended for people who usually play on big gear and just need a little bit of extra help. Um, and this is a perfect example of why it helps them so much. But if you then consider, say, the cup size of something like a Bach 1C or a Schilke 17 or something like that, if you're playing with a significant amount of lip intrusion, then the, the, the volumetric size of your mouthpiece cup is, is very much smaller than you believe. And so that's why when you learn to play with the TCE and you learn to play, keep your lip out of the cup by not overblowing, and you might be playing on something with a very flat rim like the two mouthpieces that I just showed you, what you're going to get is you'll actually be using the full size of that cup and it may effectively be larger than the effective cup size of many people who use um, a much larger mouthpiece. And that's really why, that's what all of this is about, is that if you can learn to keep the, the chops out of the cup, um, then you make the mouthpiece effectively bigger. Um, and that's why I can play on a mouthpiece that fits inside your mouthpiece and still sound like I'm playing on a big mouthpiece because, because the, the, the effective volume of the cup of my mouthpiece is the same as yours, even though yours is much, much bigger. It's an interesting thing. Um, it's another thing that's interesting about this is that if you think about um, how um, people's lips swell up because they use a lot of pressure or because they blow too hard, um, because they overblow, play too loud all the time, all of this sort of stuff. Um, Again, I count myself in this count in this camp. Twenty years ago, that's how I used to play. Um, Fifteen years ago, that's how I used to play. You know, um, you'd get you'd have a big mouthpiece, and the warming up process was at, was effectively making your lips swell enough to fill up that space so that you could get a decent note production. Um, yeah, that that train of thought has lost, left the station again. Um, yeah, lip swelling. When your when your lips swell, the amount that they swell by, or so the amount that your lips increase in size is greater than the difference in size between many different mouthpieces. So if you were to say, generally speaking, a small mouthpiece has a cup diameter of about fifteen millimeters and a large mouthpiece has a cup diameter of about 17 millimeters, then you only need one millimeter of swelling on each lip for the effective cup size to have been changed from one to the other. Now, this, this is the thing, is that when people talk about, um, you know, using bigger and smaller mouthpieces for different music or using bigger and smaller mouthpieces, um, well, for whatever reason. This isn't something that they often talk about. But this is the thing, is that effectively, if you choose to play with lip intrusion, if you choose to play in a way that, that you know on a reliable basis, your lips are going to swell by a certain amount when you feel warmed up <laughs> or when you're an hour into a gig or something like that. Um, or if you just choose to use a little more pucker or you choose to play more relaxed or all these other things, the amount that your body changes in size and shape as a result of decisions that you can make is greater than the physical difference in size and shape between many mouthpieces. And so that's why I would argue that the best course of action is to take something that um, is comfy on the chops. I like the, the rim from uh, the Super Chops 3 mouthpiece, which, um, which uh, Jerry Callet uh, took that design from a Dominic Caligio um, mouthpiece that he found in the case of a trumpet that belonged to Harry James. It's just a really comfortable rim. And for whatever reason, to do with the design, to do with its size, 
it makes a better sound in the size in this size the super chops 3 size than it does on the if it were bigger if the diameter were bigger it makes a brighter sound and i don't think that the the, the making it smaller like the one ss actually improves the design at all so i take a rim like that that i like and i can have mouthpieces with slightly different cup sizes and those differences because of my approach to playing make more difference to me than they might for someone else um and then just balance it all out with with voodoo magic in terms of choosing the right backbore and throat and matching it with the trumpet that you happen to play <laughs> um that's what puts me in a position of being able to play um with a characteristic sound in a variety of musical styles with you know what you might think is quite a small trumpet mouthpiece. So anyway, there we go. That's a, a 25 minutes of me jabbering on about, about lip intrusion and effective mouthpiece size. But I think that again, just like the last, um, the last talk I gave, the one about, uh, about the trumpet being an acoustic instrument and how an acoustic instrument needs space for the sound to develop. That was one of the most important things that Jerry taught me. And secondly, the, mo the, uh, the next most important thing um, that comes from the really general information that comes as a result of studying TCE and stuff is to do with equipment and how effective mouthpiece sizes is, is, is um, influenced by chop intrusion and how you can, you know, you, just by taking an, an efficient approach to air and note production you can actually regain that glorious sound that people are searching for by buying ever and ever and ever bigger equipment i mean this is the thing just to, to tie things up if you're buying a wider mouthpiece then the potential for filling that with lips is is much greater because you're using more of this lateral space and you're needing more of this this muscular engagement to try and prevent that chop collapse um yeah it's an interesting thing i think that you can probably draw enough from this i'm pretty sure that the the john talks trumpet channel has a really good video about lip intrusion where he puts lipstick on and does some experiments where he sort of demonstrates by the the mark that's left on the inside of his mouthpieces by the by the lipstick um, shows that although he plays on really big gear, it's effectively not that big. <laughs> okay, thanks for watching. Have a good day, and I'll speak to you all soon. Bye for now.